Welcome back to Beyond Well. I'm Sheila Hamilton, and this is a program for people who want to learn more about our interior lives. And I'm so grateful for the support of Active Recovery TMS. They're a group of one of the most dedicated teams of health caregivers in the Northwest, offering transcranial magnetic stimulation, ketamine-assisted therapy, and counseling to help people who are suffering from anxiety and depression. And you can find an office anywhere in the Northwest near you, because shouldn't mental health care be just as easy and accessible as physical health care? Yes. Welcome back to Beyond Well. I'm Sheila Hamilton, and this is a program where we learn more about our interior lives. And from time to time, we sort of look at what is happening in the world of mental health in terms of treatments and new things on the horizon. Well, January 1st, Oregon became the first state in the nation to legalize the adult use of psilocybin which is a naturally occurring psychedelic that has shown a lot of promise for treating severe depression and post-traumatic stress and end-of-life anxiety among the terminally ill. I wanted to talk with Dr. Jim Polo about it because I'm curious how regular practitioners are seeing this new breakthrough drug, which happens to be a very old breakthrough drug, and talk to you personally about your own experience with psilocybin, Dr. Polo. Hey, how are you today? Psilocybin, I remember reading about Timothy Leary and all of the experiments that came out of the 1960s when people were really just trying psilocybin on their own. Did that inform your knowledge of psilocybin as well, Dr. Polo? Yes, it actually did. Um, I actually trained in the uh, mid 80s. And most of my mentors, my teachers, my supervisors had come from that era. So they had all kind of experienced what it was like to to have psilocybin kind of come to market because it was actually available to physicians for a variety of reasons. And then, of course, it ended up getting designated as a Schedule One drug and came off the market in 1966. But between 1959, 1960, Sandoz, which is currently Novartis, was producing psilocybin for medical use. Wow. And what were some of the impacts of the patients or what were some of the impacts of the drug on the patients who took it? Um, Keep in mind that our ability to do research back then was very challenging, so it wasn't really clear how it worked. One of the problems, of course, is that there are some uh, potential symptoms uh, similar to some of the other psychedelics like LSD that can be quite dangerous. But the way in which it was used actually during those early years is doses of psilocybin allowed you to do essentially psychedelic psychotherapy. It kind of opened the mind. Folks became a little bit more able to be suggestible. Uh, There was a sense of greater sense of creativity almost, Mm -hmm. but many psychiatrists were using it to try to kind of help individuals during the therapeutic process. Unfortunately, dosing back then was very challenging. In terms of being too high or too low? Actually a little bit of both because it wasn't real clear on what are the right doses that you could potentially use. Mm. And and keep in mind that even today, even though there's lots of new research that's ongoing, it has an act, there's no definitive evidence that psilocybin is safe and effective. There's no definitive evidence that it's unsafe and harmful. And Mm -hmm. so that the research is, is ongoing. But basically, psilocybin is a derivative component that uh, is found in, in mushrooms. It's naturally found, uh, the body converts it to psilocin, and the psilocin is very active on serotonin receptors. Mm. And so the reason why I say that is because many of our antidepressants are also very active on the serotonin receptors. Wow. I've also heard that the quality of psilocybin is different in that, you know, like our understanding of neural pathways is getting a little bit more evolved where we have these sort of highways of information and the way that we think and everything and that psilocybin is supposed to sort of open a few more lanes than we might have regularly had. I had someone explain it to me that way. And I love that because I'd love more lanes. Heck, yeah. I'd, li- I'd like but a few lanes to be able to figure life out. You it's, know? it's interesting. What you're talking about is called plasticity. 
uh, psilocybin is a plastogen, a psychoplastogen. And what that means is that it has the ability to help the brain create connections from oh. one area of the brain to another area of the brain. We've never figured out just how that really occurs. But for example, if you have an injury and you have a part of the brain that's injured, your brain eventually figures out how to send those electrical impulses around that area of injury so that you can go back to whatever it was that we, you were doing, keeping in mind that it, there's a lot more capacity in our brain than we actually use. Yeah. And so plastogens, in, in this case, psilocybin, has a way of increasing those senses of connections. And those connections may be the pathway towards helping people for a variety of uh, mental health disorders. I think as a psychiatrist, you must sort of have a curiosity about the drugs that you're prescribing for your patients. Have you ever wanted to try psilocybin even a little bit to see what its impact would be on you? Yeah. So that's a great question. Keep in mind, psilocybin is not available commercially. So you can't prescribe it. And actually, as a physician, you can never prescribe anything that's a schedule one or schedule two type drug to yourself. The only way I could possibly try it would be if I was in a study myself as a as a patient. Yeah. Or or if I was somehow at a research center or doing something like that. Now, I have to be honest, I wouldn't be adverse to trying it from a micro dosing perspective. Mm-hmm. But there are some risks. And the only reason why I say I might be willing to try it is because I, I have had periods of depression in my life. Yeah. And um, I actually do take an antidepressant that happens to be a serotonin type antidepressant. Yeah. And so it's possible that it might help. What the early newer research is showing is that there may be um, some advantages to using psilocybin to help folks that have treatment resistant depression. So that very severe depression, right? Where it actually helps to improve their sense of well being, improve their emotional status, and that it's actually lasting. Now, uh -huh. that's not universal in all cases, but there seems to be a little bit of evidence showing that that could be an outcome. And that, that's one of the reasons why the research is ongoing. One of our other doctors that comes on occasionally went to one of the study centers. I think it was Johns Hopkins or wherever it was happening and actually did the psilocybin, had three truly what she described as glorious trips, thought it was the most mind expanding, loving, cohesive experience you could have. And one that terrified her so much, she will never do it again. Yes. And, and yes. so this is the crux of why I think that we need to talk about psilocybin with a dose of reality, which is some people can have a really terrible experience that is completely terrifying and they don't recover from it. That is correct. So one thing that might be helpful for our listeners to understand is that first of all, psilocybin is naturally found in a variety of mushrooms. The challenge is it's found in varying degrees of potency. Yeah. So it's not like they're all the same. Most folks refer to magic mushrooms as those mushrooms that give them kind of a trip. Usually symptoms will start in about 10 to 40 minutes after ingestion uh, and last anywhere between two to six hours. And the challenge is that there are some, quote, episodes of using psilocybin that will be very euphoric, pleasant, uh, feel like your mind is opening and so forth. And then, of course, similar to LSD, you can have a bad trip. And a bad trip can be anywhere from fear, uh, hallucinations of, of all kinds of things, a sense of panic, a heightened sense of anxiety. And of course, sometimes if people have those psychotic type symptoms where they're out of touch with reality, they can sometimes be at risk. You know, everybody's heard the story of the guy that jumps off the building because he thinks he can fly. And yeah. of course, can't. Yeah. So that's why micro dosing has come into play right now in terms of some of the research, because with micro dosing, those severe symptoms of, of disreality or, or depersonalization, derealization, those symptoms don't seem to occur. But I've also heard that you actually don't get the great opening the freeway isn't running at five lanes unless correct. you're taking the larger doses. And so correct. you are taking a big gamble, correct? You're, you are definitely taking a gamble. And, and the challenge is that um, until more research is done to find out if there's a safe and effective range, that's the risk that you take because people respond differently to different 
you know, substances. In other words, a substance that for you would be pleasant might for somebody else, that same amount be unpleasant. Or for our doctor, it was pleasant the first three times. And then perhaps she had a liver toxicity in her going on. There was some other like trauma that she really hadn't dealt with that it activated. And then the time spent in the trip, she said, felt exponential. So, you know, the wonderful things that she said, it felt like it was over in an hour when it was two or three. This one, she said, it felt like it was hours, like she was hours, in that yes. state of terror for six to eight hours. Yeah. Some of the severe symptoms, there'll be a change of perception. You don't perceive things the same way, a distortion of time. And, the, and what you've just described is very typical, feeling like things are very, very long. Yeah. And a euphoria that almost becomes spiritual and unpleasant and fearful. Mm -hmm. And when those symptoms occur, people will very often say, I don't ever want to have that again. <laughs> um, I, I often think about Oregon. I love Oregon for its, you know, creativity and its willingness to go first. I just hope that we aren't also the subject of a lot of um, terrible late night jokes if things start going really poorly, uh, because it does carry with it that risk, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one of the problems with getting, you know, legislative efforts ahead of the game is that you kind of send a message out there that it's safe. If there's something that's suddenly made legal, you know, the average citizen is going to assume, oh, this must be okay. It must be safe. Yeah. And the reality is le legislation is never based usually on science. It's because the legislators had, you know, whatever idea they wanted to put together, you know, maybe they had lobbyists, there's other issues going on that leads to the creation of a, a or the loosening of a law. Yeah. So the way that Oregon is working it is it's training a bunch of these guides and they don't have to be medical practitioners. As far as I know, they just have to be trained as guides mm -hmm. who will work within the clinic setting to be able to guide people on these trips. Now, the idea is if you feel safe, if you're in a contained environment where you can't wander off into the desert and drop into the fire, if you have enough water and you feel like you can make it through that time, it should be a good experience. But man, I was doing some research into some of the hijinks that past guides have been up to because people are yep. so vulnerable and they really have been taking advantage of people. Now, this is well, some, um, of course, who will ruin it for everyone. But you have to say that is also a risk, especially if yes. you're female. And one of the challenges is you can never guarantee that it's going to be safe for everybody. There's always going to be that one individual. I mean, we have that with regular medications that are safe and effective where one person might have a bad reaction or one person might have an allergic reaction or whatever. There's always going to be that. So, you know, when you have something new like this, there's a couple of challenges. First of all, the people that are going to be the guides, how well-trained are they? How consistent are they? Are they able to recognize signs and symptoms of something going wrong? Are they able to screen out people that may not be appropriate? So for example, with, with the psychedelics, people that have already had previous psychosis, not a good candidate for yeah. a substance that could re-evoke that psychotic uh, complex. Or people with bipolar disorder, I've heard. That's correct. Right. That's correct. Because they can become destabilized from a mood perspective and destabilized into a psychotic episode. Right. You may recall that um, we've talked previously about marijuana. And in the 1970s, you know, marijuana was pretty popular, but the kind of marijuana way back then was really very low potency compared to what we have today. Yeah. And marijuana is one of those drugs that when used excessively in some people will promote psychosis. So we've seen an increasing prevalence of teenage psychosis related to using marijuana. Yeah. And so we wouldn't want to achieve the same thing with psilocybin potentially. You and I were talking last week about how humans, when we're suffering, just really want to reach for that pill or that joint or that glass of wine or whatever it is to shift that mood state to feel better. I wonder if you could just for a minute talk about why as humans we were acclimated that way and how we began to take maybe as more Zen approach to the issues that we're going through that are highly uncomfortable. So this touches on what makes humans different from what we believe all other animal species um, seem to experience. You know, humans have the ability to recognize a sense of self 
And highly related to that sense of self is feelings and emotions about the world around us. Mm -hmm. We all have feelings all the time. And as you might imagine, when you're feeling good or having a pleasurable feeling, that can be something that you'll say to yourself, gee, I want to have that feeling again. Mm -hmm. When you're, you're having a feeling that's unpleasant, and it can be a physical or emotional unpleasant feeling, that's a feeling you'll want to avoid. Now, one of the things about hu human life is that we go through all kinds of situations that bombard us with triggers that promote one or the other set of feelings. Mm -hmm. And because we have the experience of having had a good feeling, then when we're having a bad feeling, we want to get back to the good one mm -hmm. and vice versa. And so consequently, the, the way that I've often described drug use is people that are either feeling something that they don't want to feel, they want to take it away, mm -hmm. or they're missing a feeling that they really want to feel. And they're hoping that the drug is going to give it to them. Yeah. And unfortunately, sometimes it feels that way in the short run, even though yeah. there are some risks associated with that. You know, I think the thing for me, especially with watching how readily available now MDMA and ketamine is, is sort of like, I understand having that huge serotonin rush and all those great hormones that you want and all of the opening and the feeling as if you've broken through. But it just makes sense to me that if you don't follow that up with some really good therapy about what it is that you're really going through, it's kind of all for naught. It, it's temporary is really what yeah. it is. So I, I think what you're talking about is really important because when some of these drugs have been used in the past, what's critical is that they're paired with therapy. Mm -hmm. In other words, the drug is impacting the way the brain works. And while that's going on, there's a therapeutic guided process. In the case of psilocybin, people are more suggestible. So a therapist might have a greater ability to help somebody think about something a little bit differently. But for folks that are using these kinds of substances with no real treatment, no real guide, no real therapy, basically they're going to have a period of time where they feel something, but they'll go back to where they were before. So my sister, she went into one of these clinics in Salt Lake City, a clinic in a strip mall where she paid $200 for to be strapped up to an infusion of ketamine because I had told her about how ketamine is being used in Oregon clinics all the time. And I was like, I wonder what that's like. And she said she had a really quite an uncomfortable two hours. And yeah. There wasn't anybody who came and checked in on her. She got very thirsty. She was really feeling agitated. And so she left the clinic and then she had this massive headache. So of course she's older. She was a little concerned about what she'd done to her brain, right? Mm -hmm. Not one person during that esketamine thing said, follow up with therapy. Here's what to do if you do get a headache. Here's why it's super hard to hydrate yourself enough. I am so worried about this new sort of psychedelic treatment course that were really excited about the drugs and potential money, but not as concerned about the patients. It also speaks to the issue that as humans, we want everything to be quick. We want everything to be easy. You know, So the idea is, gee, if I can take this medication and it's going to make me feel better, I don't have to do any work. I don't have to wait till tomorrow. And the reality is when you're having emotional struggles, it does take work and it takes time. And that's what helps that repair, that recovery be lasting. You know, I've had this so many times. People will come to see me. They're clearly depressed. They're looking for help, but they're hoping they can get a pill that will just take it all the way. And they don't realize, no, 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 you're going to have to struggle and deal with the fact that this relationship fall apart. There's going to be some things that you might want to explore about yourself. So I think what you're saying is absolutely correct. It's also super interesting to me because it's that kind of work. It's that deep, painful, oh, I've been in this dead relationship for 14 years that might actually truly improve your outlook and your life forever, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. How do you think you'll be using this in your practice, if at all? If we go through the studies, if it appears that there's some great benefit for people, especially who are particularly stuck, PTSD, deep depression, will you be open to it? I would be open to using it if the studies show that there is a definite benefit to using it and that there are enough safety guardrails in place that we're not going to create harm. 
in general, when new medications come out, I'm usually uh, more of an early adopter. And what I mean by that is that once the studies have demonstrated that the efficacy is there, I'm not too worried about waiting to hear from my colleagues. Yeah, I tried and it worked out well. You know, I kind of remember when, I just give you a very simple example. I remember when Celexa first came out. Celexa was kind of a brand new antidepressant uh, similar to Prozac, Zoloft, and so forth. And as soon as the studies were out, I started using it and got great results. Mm. I had some colleagues that said, you know, I'm going to wait. Mm. So when if it comes to psilocybin, if there's a if there's a medication that actually gets released, FDA approved, I will read the studies, make sure that I know what I'm doing. And for the right patients, it may be the right medication to choose if at the time it becomes available. Or if it's used in conjunction with another, if they've sort of stalled on their progress, right? Right. I mean, because that issue of antidepressants kind of becoming muted in the body and not working as effectively is real. You know, and that's that's a very important point that you just said that I probably shouldn't have glossed over so quickly. When I'm seeing folks, I do not jump to any medication. I first try to understand what's going on. There's always going to be a thought process about what's the kind of therapy that this individual needs. And because I believe therapy is much more long lasting, then I'm more likely to forego medication if there's not a strong indication for it. Now, in some disorders, medication is indicated regardless of therapy. Yeah, uh, Bipolar is a great example. I suspect even with anything that might occur with psilocybin, the key is going to be only using it in patients where it would be indicated. Mm -hmm. And the science hasn't told us yet what that is. Yeah. I do hope for the people who are suffering sake that there is good, quick research that comes out because I think I've been following these trends long enough to start to see the waning of people's enthusiasm over SSRIs individually. Part of it was that big study that came out that said it's not a chemical disorder. That was a whole thing that was fed to us by the marketing departments. And so I think people think like, oh no, uh uh-oh, what is this? Why did it work? How did it work? And could I be doing something even more effective? Exactly. Exactly. You know, you're saying something that's really kind of important is that we have consumers become a lot smarter ourselves about really what our medications are about, what it is that they can do. And there have been times when we've described the way things work in such a way that people had a different thought in their head. And so now people are thinking twice when they hear, you know, this medication is going to do whatever. Yeah, right. So. Dr. Polo, it's always such a blast to talk with you, and we'll keep checking back on Oregon's efforts to get this legalized and into the hands of people who need it, because I think as Oregonians, we should at least be paying attention. Yes, yes. (laughs) And I think here in Oregon, even though we tend to try things early, uh, eventually we find our way. That's right. That's right.